Was that a great video? So if, if you didn't catch it, uh, you know, that, that song, that, uh, that Jill, that, that uh, young lady, um, man, you know, uh, God's timing. Uh, but uh, to sing that song, too, right after that. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Psalm 13. Psalm 13. It's in the Old Testament. It's a pretty big book. There's 150 chapters, so hopefully you won't miss it. Psalm 13. Hallelujah. Psalm 13. Uh, by, the, uh, by the way, um, uh, if, if you didn't know already... Uh, the the church is, uh, has two heat zones, uh, so there's this this zone here. It has one boiler, and then the the friendship room, the nursery, uh, the offices, the youth uh, upstairs. That's another zone, and the heat went out last night apparently. Uh, so in the friendship room, especially after service, we'll we'll still have coffee, uh, but it'll be cold in that room. So definitely get your hot cup of joe, keep your coat on. Uh, after the service. I think it's probably what, it's probably like maybe 58 degrees by now in there. So I uh, just wanted to, 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 uh, to let you know that. Oh, also too, a couple weeks back we had put out these Faith Promise cards. want to encourage you, if, uh, if you haven't returned them yet, uh, please do fill them out, return them. Again, that's a, a Faith Promise between you and the Lord. And uh, really all we do is just forward it on ahead to the national office so that they can tabulate it and uh, try and figure out numbers for the coming year and, and come up with a budget uh, for how to support our, our missionaries overseas. Hallelujah. Okay, Psalm 13. Let us, let us read. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death and my enemy will say, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Brothers and sisters, that psalm that we just read is what's called a lament. And not very many people know this, uh, but the psalms are actually filled with laments. They're, uh, actually, a third of the psalms are laments, lamentations. It's the, the psalmist, some of them are David's, some of them we don't know exactly who they are, but they're crying out to God, just like we saw in Psalm 13. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Or even if we were to go, a, a, you don't have to turn there, but even in Psalm 6, for example, the psalmist says there, Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am faint. My soul is in deep anguish. How long, Lord? How long? Turn, Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. So yeah, so this is, uh, these are lamentations. These are laments. These are times in, in, in our lives where we, we say, God, where are you? Right? Just like we, we saw in the video clip. Where are you, God? And the temptation is, is, is to start to question God's character, is to start to question his intent, is to start to question his faithfulness to you and to me. So how do we worship God when suffering comes our way? How do we worship God in the trials? How do, how do we continue to lift up praise? Can we really do that? I was, on, I was just on the phone the other day with someone who is really going through a tough time right now. And, and it, was, it, was all the, it was all of the usual things that you hear when people are going through tough times. You know, is God punishing me? Did I do something wrong? I, I, you know, and, and, and he, I don't know if, if, I think this is probably just particular to Christianity in the West. We feel like if you're Christian, you have to be happy. You have to be shiny, happy-go-lucky. 
and you know, it, it's like, and and I and I, I said to the person, I said, I said, I want you to know it's okay to feel the way you're feeling. And 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 and, and then I, you know, I, I I tried my best to say, and I want you to know, God is not punishing you. This is not a punishment from God. But how do we do that? How do we? How can we worship God? And and I really do. I want to challenge you and me today because. Um, Worship is a choice, right? That's what we learned last week, right? We worship not because we feel like it. We worship why? Because we were created to do it. We are commanded to do it. And not only that, it's good for us. <laughs> because God is worthy, right? Because of who he is. Worship is a choice. And I think it's the hardest, right? Especially when we encounter trial and suffering and pain. How can we continue to worship God? even in those times. Well, I, I'd like to uh, suggest, brothers and sisters, that the way we can do that is by remembering. Remembering God's faithfulness in the past. Remembering God's mercies in the present. And remembering God's joy in the future. That's how we can do it. And so, so go with me here. I, like, um, I'm going to be bouncing from different scriptures and such, but first of all, I want to, I, I want to uh, go to the book of Job, right? And, and uh, some of us may know that book, right? It's an Old Testament book in Job, and if you read it, it's a very fascinating book because the, 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 the story starts out with God and Satan having a conversation in, in Job chapter 1. It's, it's, it's very unusual, right? It's, it says, one day when the angels, they all come and they present themselves before the Lord, Satan also came. Very interesting story, right? And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered, hey, you know, I've been roaming the earth, you know, going back and forth. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? It's almost like God is kind of doting on Job, bragging on Job to Satan. Kind of weird, right? And then, and, and, and uh, he says, yeah, you know, man, he, he's upright, and, and, and he fears me, and he shuns evil. And then Satan kind of says, well, you know, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you put a hedge around him in his household? Basically saying, he only, he's only good, and he only fears you and blesses you because you've blessed him. And Satan says, I'll tell you what. I tell you, if, if, if you removed all that, he would curse you. I bet you he would. So it's almost like God and Satan kind of made a bet. And God says, okay, just don't kill him. You know, have your way with him. And sure enough, what happens, right? Devastation comes Job's way. All of his wealth is, is taken away in a moment. All of his children are killed in a moment. Like just one thing after another, calamity after another, tragedy after another, just boom, 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 boom. Job gets up, tears his robe apart, shaves his head, which was a sign of mourning, fell to the ground in worship, and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. That's where we get that song, right? Blessed be the name, right? That song by uh, uh, Matt Redman and his wife that they wrote together. Blessed be your name, Lord. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be your name. But then, very fascinating, right? Is even after a while, he starts to develop sores on his own body, his wife even. And, and you know, I, I really believe that his wife really said this uh, not out of not out of anger. I really don't think so. I really believe she said this just out of desperation, and 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 she was just she was hopeless. 
And his wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. And he replied, You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Right? And so, so he goes, so the whole time, he's still, he's still, he's still maintaining his righteousness. He's still maintaining, he, he's not going to curse God. And then his friends come. And, uh, and, you know, they, they, they're, they're well-intentioned friends. They're coming and, and they basically say, well, Job, you must have done something bad. You must have done something bad. And, and they try to reason with him. And here's the thing about, you know, when people are going through suffering and trials, they don't need to be reasoned with. They need presence. Right? And, and in, the, in the very beginning, they started off very well. They just sat with him. And, they, and, 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 you know, and, and he's mourning and weeping, and they just sat with him. But then they opened their mouths, and that's when they got into trouble. Stuck both feet in their mouths. And, and, they're, try, and they're, you know, they're trying to reason, Job, you must have done something bad. And then finally, we get to the end of Job. And Job is pretty long. It's like 40 chapters or whatever. We almost get to the, we get to the very end, and then finally Job cracks. And he, he does say, all right, God, why me? I've been taught that if I'm good, I'll be blessed. If I'm bad, I'll be cursed. I've been good. And you're cursing me. Why, God? And then I love, I love, the, I love it. Job 38. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. And question after question, Job, I love God answers Job and says, All right, Job, you've been asking me all these questions. It's my turn. Let me ask you some questions. Stand up like a man, and I will question you. Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings sent? And then question after question. Where were you when I put the stars in place? Where were you when I put the planets in motion? Where were you when I created the earth? Where were you when I created the Leviathan and the behemoth? Where were you, Job? And I love it. I mean, it's like question after question after question. The, the Lord just peppers at him. And then in Job 42, uh, Job replies and finally says, whoops. I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. And you know what's fascinating, brothers and sisters, about all of that, even at the end of all this? And of course, toward the end there, you know, when Job, you know, comes to his senses, repents, if you will, before the Lord, God blesses him again. And in the way that the author of Job puts it, even blesses him like more than he was blessed before. And he lived to, to a ripe old age and so got to see his children's children. And, and, uh, but the fascinating thing is, right, brothers and sisters, toward the end of the book, Job is considered righteous and the friends who tried to reason with him, Job has to pray for them in order to be saved. So what's the point of this story? Well, I'm, there's a few, but the, the point that I'm trying to get across right now, brothers and sisters, is that it's okay to lament and worship. It's okay. And in fact, I would suggest that lamentation, that, that mourning in worship is, is, is the sweetest kind. Let me quote Graham Cook. 
Uh, he's, a, he's an author, deals a lot with spiritual matters and things like this. Listen to this quote that, that he has. It's a great quote. He says this. When it comes to worship and lament... The whole point about lamentation is you don't use your pain as an excuse not to worship. You actually take your pain and you bring it with you before the altar. And you stand there with your pain and you say, though all this is true, yet I will rejoice in you. It is the highest form of worship that exists. Let me read that again. The whole point about lamentation is you don't use your pain as an excuse not to worship. You actually take your pain and you bring it with you before the altar. And you stand there with your pain and you say, though all this is true, yet I will rejoice in you. It is the highest form of worship that exists. And just as Dr. Pepe reminded us in the call to worship, Romans 12, right? Offer yourselves, what? As living sacrifices. Sacrifice. Worship. It's a sacrifice. So how do we do that? Like I said, we remember the past. We remember God's faithfulness in the past. Even in the very book of Lamentations. Did you know there's a book called Lamentations in the Bible? Even in the very book of Lamentations. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. It's, it's practically right in the middle of the book, which is also really cool. Right in the middle of the book of Lamentations, the prophet Jeremiah, is, he's lamenting, and he's lamenting hard. I remember uh, I, I took a preaching uh, class at uh, Princeton Seminary a few years back, and um, Luke Powery, who was the preacher in residence at the time, I loved it. He said, every lament is a love song. Every lament is a love song. And here's, like I said, the prophet Jeremiah, and he's lamenting. And, and listen, I mean, listen to some of the things he says. I am the man who has seen affliction. God has made my skin and my flesh grow old and has broken my bones. God has pierced my heart with arrows from his quiver. He's broken my teeth with gravel. Man, this is serious. So I say my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them and my soul is downcast within me. Yet, 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 this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Brothers and sisters, we remember the Lord's faithfulness. And, 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 and here's what I mean by this. All right? And just like even with, with God and Job and saying, where were you, Job, and all of this. And you know, basically what, what God was basically saying is, hey, Job, you know, there's a lot that you've just accepted in your life. You've never even questioned it a minute. Right? You never even questioned how the stars get there or how the planets get there or how the sun get, you know, rises every morning and, 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 and sets every evening. You've never questioned and, and, and for us to remember what God ha how God has been faithful in the past, brothers and sisters, it's about remembering, like I said, sometimes the things that we take for granted. Oh, wow, God, thank you so much. Someone said, I'm vertical today. Yeah. I mean, we were at the men's breakfast the other day, I think we were talking about, wow, you know, yeah, clean water. Even just the little things. But how about the big things where God's been faithful? Come on. We can remember that. And, and there's a difference between remembering God's faithfulness and nostalgia. There's a difference. Right? Nostalgia is, is, you know, it's kind of this romanticized version of the past, right? Oh, the good old days. I wish it was like the good old days. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about just remembering God's goodness 
in, your, in the past. Remembering his faithfulness in the past. And of course, we're part of a, 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 of a history that spans thousands of years even. God's faithfulness, right, to the Israelites. God's faithfulness to Abraham. God's faithfulness to Moses. God's faithfulness to David. God's faithfulness. And then by sending Christ. And what do we do every time we celebrate communion? The Lord's Supper. Do you realize that in, uh, in the Greek, uh, giving thanks is the same word that we use for communion, Eucharist. It's a combination of grace and joy, giving thanks. And what do we do in the communion, right? We remember God's sacrifice in the past. Thank you, God. That's a great way to be able to worship God even in the midst of suffering and pain and trial is remember God's faithfulness in your past. Don't forget that. Remember his mighty deeds, his miracles. Remember, your, remember the joy of your salvation. Can I get an amen? amen. Remember God's faithfulness in the past. But then, how do we remember his mercies in the present? How do we do that? And again, like I said, when, when, especially when it feels like everything else is, is saying otherwise. And, um, uh, you know, what's, what's very interesting is, um, just like the, the video clip that we saw here in the beginning, right, is the, the uh, Jill, uh, the woman who had, uh, who had um, had Max at 23 weeks and five days old. You know, what did, what did she say? I didn't feel God. It didn't, I didn't feel it like I normally do. But I, and she said, I, I pushed through. I worshipped anyway. In the book uh, by Matt and Beth Redman about the song that they wrote together, Blessed Be Your Name. They quote uh, the heart posture of a Nazi concentration camp prisoner who once scribbled these lines onto the wall of his cell. I believe in the sun, even when it is not shining. I believe in love, even when I feel it not. I believe in God, even when he is silent. I believe in the sun, even when it is not shining. I believe in love, even when I feel it not. I believe in God, even when he is silent. Brothers and sisters, and the key to giving thanks, the key to worshiping God, even in the midst of suffering and trial, remembering God's mercies in the present. You know, uh, I've said this before too, you know, uh, and again, we're commanded, give thanks in everything. Give thanks in all circumstances, right? And, and, and that's what it says in, in, uh, in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5. Right? It says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And in a similar way, in Ephesians, uh, again, Paul says it just a little bit differently, but he says, Hey, make the most of every opportunity, redeem the time because the days are evil. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and we can even give thanks for our enemies. And even when the trials come and, and, the, and, the, and the suffering comes and the pain comes, we can even give thanks for that. And here's why. I love the way C.S. Lewis puts it. Listen to this. We ought to give thanks for all fortune. If it is good, because it's good. If bad, because it works in us patience, humility, and the contempt of this world and the hope of our eternal country. True worship and gratitude comes, brothers and sisters, from seeing God's merciful hand in the present as well. Even in whatever we're going through, And, and, and again, not, not that uh, when someone is going through a trial or a struggle, you know, not, not that that's the time to try to reason with them and give them all philosophical explanations on why God allows suffering in the world. But the thing is to remember, oh yeah, that's right.
God is all powerful. There's a mystery we don't quite fully understand. But God is present. And just like we read in Lamentations, his mercies are new every morning. That we have a God who suffers with us. I don't think any other faith system in the world can claim that. That we have a God who can suffer with us in the present moment. We have a God who went ahead of us. We have a God who knows what it's like. We have a God who's been to the cross. And we can remember his mercies now. There's fresh mercies available every morning, brothers and sisters. All you got to do is call on them. All you got to do is ask for them. All you got to do is say, all right, God, I want to remember your mercies in the present. And here's the thing. Remember God's faithfulness in the past. Remember his mercies in the present. Remember the joy that's in the future. Brothers and sisters, we know the joy that's in the future. And, and here's the thing about uh, uh, a grieving and lamenting and, and pain in the, in the present and suffering. You know what? The joy may be gone, but hope is not. Right? We can grieve, we can lament, but not as those without hope. And right, what do we see in Hebrews 12? Right? After that great hall of faith that we read in Hebrews 11, I was telling somebody the other day, you know, I went to a Baptist uh, grade school, Southern Baptist grade school. Maybe that's why I'm so hard on Baptists. And I had to memorize whole chunks of the King James Version Bible, and one of them was Hebrews chapter 11. And right, that great hall of faith, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Noah, by faith, David, by, you know, by all of these, by faith, Samson, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith right? And it says, therefore what? Since we're surrounded by these great cloud of witnesses, brothers and sisters. And of course, the author of Hebrews is writing to a persecuted people, a persecuted church. And he's saying, hey guys, we've got all of these saints that went ahead of us and they're cheering you and me on right now. And he says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy, for the joy set before him, what? He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him, consider Christ who endured such opposition from sinners. Why? So that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Brothers and sisters, we can offer that sacrifice of praise and worship to God, even in the midst of trial and pain and suffering, especially then, especially in the midst of heartache and tragedy. Why? Because we remember the joy set before you and me. We remember that. We know the end of the story. We know. I can't remember if I've, if I've asked this question uh, once before, but um, does anyone ever have a picture of Christ singing? I forget who said it, but, you know, Jesus is the singing Savior, right? Does anyone have a picture of Christ singing? Laughing? Okay. We don't really get much in the way of imagery, right, of Christ singing. Right, there, there's one reference uh, in one of the Gospels where the, the, uh, the Jesus and his disciples, right, a after, after they celebrate the Last Supper, what, they, they, they were singing. They ended the time in singing. Brothers and sisters, Jesus was singing on the cross. How do we know that? Well, guess what? If you want, you can turn with me to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Of course, that's the one before the famous Psalm 23. 
The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, right? He makes me to lie down in green pastures, leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. But you know what? Not a lot of people will know that Jesus sang Psalm 22 from the cross. The Psalms are sung, brothers and sisters. And Jesus on the cross sings, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Right? All the Gospels quote Jesus saying that that's what he said, right? Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus sang that from the cross, brothers and sisters. And if you read on in Psalm 22, guess what happens? Just like all the other lament psalms, that if you really take a careful look, yeah, they, they're authentic, they're honest, they're raw. God, where are you? How long, O oh Lord? And let that be, a, let that be a, a permission for you and me. It's okay to do that with God too. I don't know who said it, uh, you know, but God is not going to be offended by you being honest before him and saying, God, where are you? God, where are you? Where are you with my kids? Where are you with my finances? Where are you in my marriage? God, where are you? How long, oh Lord? Why, Lord? It's okay. I want you to know that. It's okay. But if you notice the pattern in the Psalms, brothers and sisters, it always ends with hope in the Lord. It always does. And why? Because the psalmist remembers God's faithfulness, his character in the past, remembers his mighty deeds, and remembers his mercies in the present. Look, if you were to read on in Psalm 22, we, we even go a little bit further down. Listen to this in verse 19. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of lions. Verse 22, I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. And it goes on and on and on. Verse 26, the poor will eat and will be satisfied. And now he's, the psalmist is starting to remember the joy in the future. Because he's saying, yeah, that's right. One, one day, the poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn... He has done it. Brothers and sisters, don't forget. Don't forget the hope that you and I have in Christ. Don't forget that. Right? And I, I tell people all the time, right? We're what are we told in Scripture? Right? That we walk by faith, not by emotion. Not by circumstance. Not by how well the giants are doing. We don't walk by any of those external things, brothers and sisters. We walk according to faith in Christ. Not how we've done, but what he's done. And what he will do. Can I encourage you today, brothers and sisters? Maybe you're going through a tough time right now. Or maybe even, you know, when you hear the news, goodness... You wonder, God, how can we worship you? I want to challenge you and me today. Like I said, worship is a choice. And especially in the midst of tragedy or pain or suffering, to choose to worship God. It's the sweetest, highest form of worship we can offer. 
recognizing God's sovereignty and goodness.